everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Ray Flores, and this is Nazi Peretz, our web guru for USC Law School. And this has been a busy year for us, as you can see. In this year, we've done Google Apps, iTunes, and YouTube. It's been a fun year, though. One of the things I wanted to start off with is a little bit of history about USC. We're not a really large school as far as the law school. We've got about 750 students, but we're part of a much larger university with 35,000 students. So anything we do, we have to work with the larger university. And so that always adds a level of complexity that we have to deal with whenever we want to introduce something new. And up until two years ago, we had a pretty centralized support model where the central ID did most of the support. But there were lots of issues with that and that everything they did was cookie cutter. So nothing was customized for the schools or particularly worked the greatest way. So they decided to switch over to what they call the federated model, where each school had a lot more IT control and IT budget and did things in-house. Since they knew their customers, they could do things a lot better. At the law school, we've been doing this for a very long time. So we were the poster child for the new federated model. And the couple things that our central IT still does for us is network support, email for the students, and our SIS. Now, our biggest complaint from our students was the email. We've been using a Sun system that has been around for about 10 years and really hasn't changed much in 10 years. Web-based interface to your email, no collaboration, no integration, nothing else. A lot of limitations that the students had to deal with, like 25 megabyte um, quota, um, rolling six-month retention. So they spend a lot of time managing their mailbox instead of actually working. So we pushed to bring in Google Apps because we wanted to give this to our students and help them out. And um, we looked to ASU. ASU was the first one to implement Google Apps at their school. And they were very helpful to us, and so was Google. And because of the strides we made and us being the first ones out going Google Apps, now the entire university is using Google Apps. And instead of going into a lot of detail right now, I'm going to let Nazi do a demo of our Google Apps implementation. All right. So you, uh, you actually have to be a student to uh, get a Google account with us. And I've never paid tuition, but I uh, made myself a student, graduated in 2007. And this is the page that students go into. It's just lawmail.usc.edu. Um, we customized it, and we did single sign-on for Google. Um, the code for that single sign-on is on your CD. It's called Google SOS for Cali. Um, I think password is just marked XXX. You just switch that to your account using your own password. So let me go ahead and log in. And this saved me about $36,000 in tuition for the first time. Um, so you see, you log in, you get your USC logo on the left. Uh, they're not doing CSS customization, so we're actually stuck with UCLA's colors instead of our colors. Uh, but that being said, this is what a student sees, and they get mail, calendar, documents, and sex. We, the management interface is up here, so anyone who's a domain administrator will see this. And you click manage this domain, and the things that you see are how many active users are currently, how many accounts we've created total, and it's important to note, this is not the number of students we have. We have alumni and students using it, so it's both. Um, and then here, it's the services that you have on, and as more services turn on, for instance, they're going to add Google Groups down the line, and blogs, etc. Those turn on over here automatically, and we're in the beta, the beta, sorry, beta sign up group, so we get those ahead of time. Um, and here's where you do some administration. You don't have to use their interface to administer this. Um, I'll get into more detail on how you create accounts, how you delete accounts, et cetera, later. Um, but this is where you can also call their support 24-7. They have, they have this free number along with your customer PIN that you can always call if any service is down. It has not been down since we've implemented it. Um, 
and you can control basically everything. Uh, like I said, appearance was limited, but the rest is pretty flexible. I'll hand it back to Ray to talk to you guys about um, the pros and cons to using Google. Okay, we found that actually a lot of pros and very few cons for not going to Google. Some of the best things were the features. They get everything is integrated and it all works together. Unlike our old email system, which was strictly just a basic email system, it says email, calendaring, uh, docs, and talk. So everything is integrated. Students can collaborate with each other. They can all work in a document at the same time, share things. It just gives them so much more flexibility and a lot more features that it helps them do their work. The other thing is they're always improving. Google is on top of this. We started, there was a two gig quota on the email boxes. In the past year, it's now up to 6.5 gigs, which no one's coming close to even using that, which is great. The other thing is cost. It costs nothing. That's one of our biggest motivators. <laughs> um, marketing. Google, everyone knows Google. That's one of the things we noticed when we started looking at this whole movement to Google Apps. 70% of our students were already forwarding their accounts to either Gmail, MSN, Yahoo, or some other system. So we were just the pass-through at that point. This way, it helped us in the fact that students already used Gmail. 50% of our students were already using Gmail, so to them there was no learning curve. They were actually teaching us how to use it and showing us how to use the features. And they just jumped on board and they're using all the capabilities to the fullest extent. And you know, we're shocked because the support is also great too. We expected, you know, I got all my guys trained, ready to go. No calls came. It just worked. And the students love it and the things that they can do. And since the law school was the first one to implement this, then you heard the rest of the students from the rest of the school clamoring as to why don't we have this if the law school has it. So the very next semester, they went ahead and implemented it. So that's where the zero learning curve comes in. Some of the cons change. No one likes change. So it's always difficult to push change. Fortunately, we, like I said, are kind of segregated so we can do our own thing. And so that helped us to move forward. Politics, once again, that's part of change and the fact that we have to deal with central IT made things a little bit more difficult, but we were able to get past that. Control, giving up some of the control, that was a hard thing that people had because now all your data is stored elsewhere. It's not on campus, it's not part of the campus, so we don't have the full control. Security kept coming up as an issue. People were worried about the fact that our data is stored somewhere else. But you've got companies, I think it's the FBI uses Google Apps. I mean, if they can depend on it, how are we not going to be able to depend on it? Also, I think I have a lot more respect and credibility for Google Apps than anything that our central IT can do in-house. <laughs> <laughs> they have unlimited funds. Everything's always up. If you can hear once in a great while about Google Apps being down for like five minutes or 10 minutes, as opposed to our central system, which was down quite frequently and still is, because it's still up, running in parallel with the other system, but we've never heard any problems with Google Apps. And we were actually extremely shocked no phone calls, nothing. I've been doing IT for 25 years, and I've been involved in hundreds of implementations and migrations. This was the most seamless, easy, beneficial situation I've ever been involved in. And, you know, we love Google Apps. <coughs> Mostly what we can say here. Uh, there was an issue of job security. Our you know, email admins worried, well, what am I going to do if they're doing my job? The great thing is now you can do some real work that's going to help people internally. Because we know working at law schools, the real important thing is being there for our users and helping faculty do what they need to do to get their job done. Cutting edge, that's not part of what we do. Reliability, stability, when they call and they need help, someone comes right away and helps them. And that's important to us. So job security really wasn't an issue. Initially, it sets off some bells, but I think at this point, everyone's very happy with the system. It's less work for our people so they can focus on more important things. So some of the reasons we decided to join, which is in a nutshell, is it's a better system. It's something better than we could ever possibly do in-house. <coughs> Student expectations have changed over time. And this is the way they do business. They know Google. They know um, texting. Even email right now is 
it's kind of like, that's old hat. You don't email, they all text. So this helps us to stay on that cutting edge and keep up with what's going on, because Google can also adapt and change much quicker than we can. Cost savings. Not only the fact that it's a zero cost, but I don't have to run servers, I don't have to do updates, I don't have to have a large server room with air conditioning costs and power costs. I mean, it really saves us a lot of time and money. Um, minimal support, like I said, it just works. We're really amazed and impressed at how it works. And then finally, um, Google's willingness to help. Google is an awesome company. We've dealt with a lot of these large companies, but Google's always been right there for us. They send people out, they have a 24-7 support number that Nazi was showing you. They're right there for us, and they've helped us every step of the way, and they listen to what we say. If we tell them there's a problem with this, or can you change this, we have seen our changes come back. Or if you try and do that with Microsoft, it just doesn't happen. <laughs> contracts. Now, contracts is always fun. And we have our central IT department, so we got our legal counsel department that we have to go through to sign any type of contract. One of the things that made this successful for us was that we teamed up with the provost office. And we pushed this idea to them and told them it would be great for the entire school. And they bought into it, so that made life much easier as far as dealing with legal counsel, contracts, getting the entire school on board. Um, what we negotiated was better than their initial contract, so they're very flexible and open. <coughs> However, I can't go into the details because then I wouldn't be able to let you leave the room. <laughs> so you see, um, and that we can cancel at any time. So if we decided later we wanted to switch over to Microsoft, we could. Or if Apple comes up with a new service, we can't. And there's no repercussion. Once again, it would be difficult because we'd have to implement change. But at this point, we see no reason. Google has been great for us. And then part of it is building that relationship with Google. One of the things that they're going to do this fall semester, they're going to do a Google tour. And they're sending this big 1920s bus out to the USC. And they're going to give away a bunch of swag, USC swag and Google swag and interview students, and actually even some of our PR people are going to go on the bus with them, and they're going to drive down from Google to USC, and then they're going to go to several other universities, basically pushing the Google message, and we're going to be a part of that. So, you know, they really care about the people in education particularly, because that's where they started. As far as the implementation plan, um, once again, working with the provost office made it all successful for us. Couldn't have happened without them. Um, we did the initial launch internally at the law school, the proof of concept. It went great. They kind of even didn't believe how great it went until they did it, and then they were shocked at how easy things went. And um, currently it's implemented throughout USC. Next year will be our first group of students that will get in the first year, so we're expecting by the end of next year, the entire school will be on board Google Apps. Um, the initial project plan is pretty large. It's actually on the CD if you want to take a look at all the steps that we did to implement the program. But like I said, with Google's help, it went pretty smooth. As far as support, like I said, we contacted ASU. They were very helpful. They're actually pretty big school, 65,000 students. So we figured if they can do it with 65, we can at least do 750. Um, we had also multiple meetings with Google Apps engineers where they actually came out to our campus or conference calls and they were very helpful. Nazi knows them all by name. Um, students get email support. If they have a problem, they can send an email in and get a response. We have a help desk. We're, we're still waiting for calls to come in. There aren't any calls. It just works. Um, our tech staff has a 24-7 number and Google, like I said, is very responsive to what we do. And as far as training, we set up an entire page for training for the students. We even set up training sessions. The first week of school, every day at lunch, we set up training sessions. First day we had maybe 25 people. By the third day we had like a handful of people. And they weren't asking questions of how to use Google. It was really how do I forward my email to the Google system, or how do I use Outlook to access my Google. Really no Google questions. It was great. We canceled the last two sessions because they were done. And they were on board. And they had Nazi give you a quick demo of the page that we set up. So we'll go back to the sort of interface later in more detail. 
Um, the page is the one that we were on. It's lawmail.usc.edu. At the bottom of the page, we have FAQs, important contacts, email forwarding, basically all the questions that we heard in our first week in our training sessions. So if you go to FAQ and you hear, so why are we changing this new email system? Because we said so. No, we didn't write that. Uh, so this is, it starts explaining. You see, it still says 2 gigabytes. It's up to 6.5, and it just changes. It just increments without us knowing anything. Um, importing contacts, there's a step-by-step. -step, and what we did is we created these demos that they could just follow. Um, and they're flash demos. So I'm not sure how they'll play on these machines. Um, but they're pretty straightforward. So it says click the Start button. It's down to the basics. And even these demos, we had our student workers create because they knew Google better than us. So it's basically showing you how to export your contacts from Outlook and then import into the Google. Um, and the students found these helpful. That's what that's the questions we were getting. And then um, I think the FAQ in a couple of places were actually pointing them to uh, Google's pages because they have some more explanations than we did, but. We try to cover everything from documents and spreadsheets to how do you set up your email on your BlackBerry, how do you set up your email on your Outlook. And, um, and I think since this page came about, we didn't have any calls to our student support lady. Let me hand it back to Ray now. And one of the great things is the mobile access. We've got more students going out and buying mobile devices just so they can get their Google apps because everything's there, their calendar, keeps them on track with their classes and what's going on. And then with all these calendars, you can create individual calendars, for instance, like school-wide events, and they just subscribe to that calendar and they can see all the events that are occurring in the law school. And it just overlays on top of the existing calendar, so it's really nice. And they can, you know, they can have uh, club calendars and just subscribe to what they want to see. Um, next part I'm going to go into is acceptance. We had 90% participation of our students within the first month, and then it quickly rose to 100%. So all of our law students are on board and using Google and happy. With uh, um, Central University, they did 40% in the first month, and they're currently at 60%. Like I said, by the end of next year, they'll be at 100% also. So, end result, we love Google, students love Google, administration loves Google. We had no negative effect, no problems, no issues, no concerns, everything's been great. I'm gonna let Nazi go into a little bit more of the tech detail. If you have any questions at all, feel free to interrupt. Nazi's our guru and he knows all this stuff inside now. Go ahead. I was just curious, you said student and alumni? Yes. yes. All right. It, I'll do walk you, have, you through both of those right now, actually. Do you have differentiation? Uh, the only differentiation is actually Google. Cool. Uh, so you're probably wondering, do they read your email? Well, I'm worried about ads? the advertising. Yeah. So students don't get ads. Right. And alumni, they're actually set to get ads, but they're not getting ads yet. So Google hasn't turned that feature on. And we're not going to remind them of that. <laughs> so, um, but that's what's meant to happen. So, our anyone with a year, because our, our naming convention is such that the year is in it. Mm -hmm. So, anyone with a particular year should get ads, but they have not said that. The other nice thing with alumni is they get that email address as a student, and when they become alumni, they maintain that email address for lifelong email address. Yeah. So, we always have contact with them. Another question that, sorry. Uh, you've been talking about doing Google for a while um, for students, and one of the big things that keeps coming up is their, their privacy concerns, and that they basically they claim ownership to all of the data that you that gets sent to them. And has it been a problem for your organization? How did you deal with that? How did you get people on board knowing that any email that got sent to them was going to be owned by Google and could be used for whatever purposes they wanted to? The, the, the only thing they said is they would use it for aggregate data. So, for instance. 50% um, of users at USC have the word computer and Dell in their emails. So it's robots reading and aggregating data. It doesn't say Ray Flores had the word Dell computer 14 times in his email. So it's not associated with the name. And then the, the bigger deal is how do you handle subpoenas? How do you go in and when they request your student's email? Their legal counsel, I imagine, is stronger than ours. But our legal counsel said, that uh, 
they agreed that they would fight the subpoena as much as possible, and then if they needed to run the data and let us know. Craig, we had our IP professors involved in this and general counsel, and they all signed off on it. We were everybody. Um, speaking about email addresses, um, now when students or alumni, when they get their email address from USC, um, are you maintaining your email domain, or are they, do they have gmail.com as their? No, it's the same domain. So our selling point was to create your account today and keep this account for the rest of your life. <coughs> so the same name, same domain, everything. It's, it's never going to change. Are you doing the forwarding at USC? No, no, not forwarding, real account. Really? Yeah. So our domain is the student's name, first name, dot last name, dot year of admission, at lawmail.usc.edu. And that stays for life. Yeah. Let me pull that up for you. So that's the email address. That's my personal address. Second question. Um, now, if you get into an issue where a student loses email and they need to get something restored, what happens? Great question. Not possible. You. <laughs> Could you repeat the question? Back if they up. lose an email, back back up. so say they delete it and they lose it again from their right. deleted yeah. items, mm -hmm. it's gone. And the button is will just delete forever. <laughs> there is an option that you would have to pay for, and I think it's $25 per student per year. And they bought Posty, so they can do an archiving solution and go back a year and pull out emails. You just have to pay for that additional feature. Like I said, we've been running it a year now. We haven't run into that problem. That's one of was one of our concerns. Yes. You said you'd implemented it for students and alumni. alumni. Why not faculty? Oh, good question. Faculty and staff are currently using Exchange um, at the law school, and they're very happy with Exchange. We don't have a quota for them. Um, you can imagine what faculty would say if you have a quota. Um, and they've been, they like the counter collaboration, and I don't think they're as web savvy as our students, so they like a desktop client. Um, there's some, we go to Google meetings, and there's some things they're working on that will enable us to migrate our faculty and staff down the line, and that's definitely our plan. Right now, the USC contract states only students and alumni. We can definitely do um, faculty, and they won't charge us. We just haven't got that far yet. It was easier to go move forward with just students and alumni, so we went that route initially. But if they wanted to collaborate, a faculty wanted to collaborate with the students, yeah. There's no way to do it unless they get a, using Google Apps, there's no way to collaborate until they get a Google. Correct, correct. You can still, if you're, for instance, working on Google Docs, you can invite a non-Google person to participate. Okay. With your, our law school address. Right. Uh, question regarding delivery confirmation. Does Google support that at all so you can verify that a student got a particular email? It does not. There's two ways of doing this. You can have your email first go through your school so that you can do your own confirmation at the gateway level, or you can have it go straight to Google. Or the third way would actually, if you pay that $25 per user per year fee, then you have more administrative tools, more reporting features, and you can look into that. So. Let me say, so there's the straight MX. You can change your MX record to point to Google which means all the email goes to their email server. That takes some bandwidth off of your internal network, too. Or you can still point to your gateway, say your Barracuda box, and then point to Google, which they'll do as well. Or you can use Postini services, which was Ray mentioned. It's like an administrative panel that shows you all the emails that have gone through. You can do filtering there. If you do choose to have um, email addresses that are through your own network first, is there an issue with Google's um, spam filtering on their own side that may damage the reputation or be based on the reputation of that one ID that's forwarding everything? No, they actually, as long as you keep the header untouched, they can do all the parsing that they need to do for spam and, and virus. We just recently you migrated to uh, Google Mail as well for alumni, and I guess we, we don't have that many alumni to deal with. How do you deal with your alumni in terms of supporting them basic day-to-day problems by like forgot password and Great question. Um, so we have all the alumni, they don't go through this 
page because it hasn't been announced to them, they, they go through this page. This is our main portal, and they can create an account here. They can um, create an account here. And then this is a forgot login. If you forget your password actually three times, well, let, me, let me just do this real quick. So if you fail three times, look, forgot login gets enormous. So they go to us. It's, a, it's the same password for our portal than their Google uh, password. So they use this forgot login to reset it. And if all fails here, there's also a phone number within here that tells them. So you see here, they choose who they are, alumni. You should put in their email address and we'll reset it for them. And this is an external email address. We don't allow you to use your Google address here. Um, let me actually, that's a good transition to log in as an alumni. Um, so as you can see, 2007, I graduated last year. So I'll go ahead and log in. Do not make fun of the photo. Um, this top toolbar is what alumni get access to. Some of these services are local to us. Others are Google services. So for instance, we got the homepage. That's this one. Uh, and this is a very MySpace, Facebook look and feel. You know, you got your friends, you got your events, your comments, etc., your forums. Um, then you have the class page, which is ours. I'll just step through that real quick. Then you have your email system, which is Google's. Your classmate search is us. Job board is us. Photos is us. Calendar, again, Google system. Documents, Google system. Give online, that's definitely us. <laughs> Um, email. So let me jump into email. What it does is just logs them into their email from here, and that's my account. So now that you saw that, that we did single sign-on um, using uh, authentication against our database, a SQL database, but our USC main campus <coughs> IT did it using SHIB 2.0, which is just SAML 2.0 compliant. Um, the, Google, the code for that integration is Java code. The one that I gave you is uh, authenticating as a SQL database. You can use that. Google provides you an initial sample. We just modified it a little bit. And then, um, how do we create accounts for alumni? You can have two routes. You can pre-create all the accounts for your 9,000 alumni, or you can wait as they register and then create the accounts. In our case, we decided to wait as they register so we can get some real stats on who's using it. So we create them in real time, and uh, the code for that is actually in your CD as well. And it's pretty simple. Um, I'll cover provisioning in the next slide, but it's, it's rather simple. And you see it's, you know what, 80 lines. Um, then the management interface for accounts, I showed it to you briefly, and I'll show it to you again. Uh, manage this domain. User accounts. And everything that you can do in this interface, you can do in their provisioning API. So these are the things you can do. You can change a user's password. You can't view a user's password as, as we were used to in our days. Um, and this particular account we're looking at is an alumni. You can add nicknames, which are aliases to his account. So it doesn't have to be, and I think you can add up to three aliases for each account. Can you use the lot report students that change the name when they come to the US? Yeah. On the uh, passwords, do they have uh, complexity requirements? Yeah, they do. Um, and it's, it's not that harsh. You know, some people have three numbers and an uppercase and lowercase. It's really not that harsh. I think they just have a, a limit. They need to be five characters or more. As they're typing it, it shows a little bar that goes from good to great. It tells you how big your password is. Now, is that something that you negotiated with them, or you, you, know, you must use their criteria? No, it's their criteria. It's the same criteria that Gmail uses. And believe it or not, Gmail is not even as good as five characters or more. Um, now let's go back to the slides. I'll show you the alumni usage. I just showed you that real quick. And the student usage, um, I showed you that to go directly into logging in. And what we find is that more and more are using docs, but um, for sharing outlines. 
even though we had created a tool internally to share and rate outlines, they're using docs to just basically the whole class collaborates on one outline. Um, next, I'll cover the provisioning API. And the reason I want to show you this is because you don't, I'm, I'm not sure you necessarily want to use Google's account creation, because it's one at a time, it'll be pretty painful. So what we did is we ran through our entire database of students and we just created all their accounts. So I'll go ahead and log in as an admin now. And our help desk person has access to this, which is user administration. And when she creates a student account locally in our database, it also creates an account in Google at the same time. Um, the delay is about three seconds. So as she hits add student, she waits about three seconds, and then it creates and she gets a notification back that it's, that it's live. Um, this page that alumni have access to, our alumni department, so if I hit directory administration, this is actually pulling from Google live right now. So that just queried Google, um, and it shows you everything about the account. If you do a view, this also just queried Google, and it got some information about them, um, what's private, what's public. All right, now I'm going to hand it back to Ray. Any more questions that Google asked? Do you, you create multiple accounts uh, for dumping a Yes. Yeah. So they have an interface in which you can actually you can actually um, create accounts, uploading the file, or you can just loop through it, whichever you prefer. So upload many users at once. Here's an easy text file format. Just upload that. Excuse me. Yeah. Before going with Google. Did you consider other alternatives like Microsoft? We looked at Microsoft. Uh, one of the key reasons we didn't like Microsoft is they don't do free faculty. It's free students and free alumni, but not free faculty, and they weren't as responsive. Also, they well, they do have pretty much the same tools. If you look at all their tools that they're integrating now, at that point when we were looking, they really weren't there. It was just email and calendaring, but they're. Google is just so much more responsive and you get things done and they, they're negotiable and they're flexible, whereas Microsoft, this is what you get, take it or leave it. But let me correct Ray right for a second, they weren't not responsive, they were mean. <laughs> I got a call from a sales guy and they were just mean and pushy. Have you had to track individual messages? If you do the Barracuda way, you can track individual messages. And if you find it in your so Barracuda log, can you then give that log to Google and say, you know, this user said they never got this message? Only if you if you buy into their Postini solution. If not, they won't. You can't get that amount of detail. And Postini was a recent acquisition of theirs for a mere six hundred and fifty million. Yes. You mentioned that you can cancel this um, at any time if, if you don't, you know, if you have reason to. What are the terms for Google? Can they cancel, and what kind of notice do they give you? They're tied to a multi-year zero-cost contract. <laughs> you can't go into details. Okay. <laughs> but it's a, it's a long period. Yes, longer than their initial offer. So we're locked in. We have them for free for this many years. We can cancel at any time, but they can't. Okay. So. It works out good. It's good having lawyers on staff. You mentioned something about uh, that Google would give free email to faculty as well. Yes. Uh, is that without ads? Without ads. They, they haven't told us that they would put ads to anybody in our university until they leave. Just alumni, right. Because when you leave, you're the same as you know, me. Staff, and student, outside. faculty, get no ads. Only when you become alumni, then you're forced to get ads. But like I said, we haven't seen ads yet. And I can actually go into my account and, and see if we can find any ads. When the ads start, are they supposed to be in the outgoing email body also, or just on the web interface? Mm -hmm. So you have alumni send a 
an email and you think they'll be independent of registration? Well, he's going to log in so we can see because since we haven't seen ads, we don't know yet. Yeah. I'm, this is my alumni account. I'm just going to open something like reunion guests. Ads are usually here. You can see it's all white now. So I'm still not getting ads. And the ads you typically get are just a one line across the top. It's not real pervasive. It's not huge ads that you would get normally with Gmail. It's a little bit less intrusive. This is just my RSS feed up here right now. It's not ads. Uh, and there's, you know, those big squares right here correlated to the words in your email. Those are not there. Because, you know, the hard work. And somebody said, give us the same deal as USC. <laughs> yeah, but we can't tell you what our deal was. <laughs> you can, I, and I would encourage that. I think what happens is um, it's the weight. What Ray says, if you come up and talk to your provost office and you say, we will implement this eventually for all our students, and your school is, say, 30,000 people, then you have more weight then if you just come in as a law school as us and tell them, hey, we have 700 students. So bundle up with, you know, show them that you have a quantity, and then they'll, their terms change quickly. Did you do that with Microsoft? <laughs> we didn't even try it. <laughs> we know Microsoft has certain levels. You have to be a certain size school to get to certain techs or certain sales reps. Otherwise, they won't even talk to you. Yeah, I'm part of the same university. New York and they just signed up with Microsoft. Oh, they did? Like, about hundreds of thousands of students. Yeah, right. that's the size of implementation they look for. I was just going to add that I uh, actually had conversations with Google about this kind of a thing, and uh, I, I can say that there's an interesting bit of major of, uh, it seems like they're willing to have put anything on the table in the conversation. Yeah. Um, but that uh, as you start to uh, steer it to very great specifics, they want to keep it into a non-disclosure kind of a situation. So it, it's really interesting that I think they're very flexible and they really, really want to get penetration in the market. But the moment you start to deviate from the advertised norm, it's, uh, but we won't discuss this with anyone. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure that's really productive in a way And that, you know, I love the fact they're aggressively pursuing us. Yeah. But, you know, we have a, a thousand buried deals versus making it, you know, really attractive and affordable on a broad basis might, sure. might help. I think they just want to have that conversation with you. Yes. Right. And once again, try and deal with Microsoft and you'll see a difference right off the bat. Oh, no, I wouldn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So getting back to our presentation, we'll head to uh, YouTube now. Well, next is YouTube. Any more questions on Google Apps? Um, yes. I'm, sorry. I'm sorry if you already covered this. I have a question about the, the account creation process. So if a student, uh, while they're getting their JD, <coughs> already apparently enrolled and, and they've gone to the program, and then they graduate, it's a different account, is what I'm understanding. No, it's created. Nothing changed. So, so how did you get the, the, the convention, first name, last name, and year? It's predicted graduation year? No, so we, we have a database of that already. Right, and it is predicted graduation date. Yes, and it's uh, our program is standard three year. So it's pretty easy to calculate it. Okay. Um, so you don't have any using for if you do, if you have a combined with an MBA, it's four years. So it's easy math. You know what the program is. All right, so let there be video. That's what we call this now. Now, going to YouTube was much easier after the success that we had with Google Apps. So, you know, we got the provost office on board, made it easy, contracts went fairly smoothly. Our main reason for going here was outreach to reach the world, something that we couldn't do internally, and also, once again, the marketing tool and to meet student expectations. Students know YouTube. They use it as part of their culture. So we want to give them what they're used to. And once again, I'm going to let Nazi start with the demo and show you what it looks like. So uh, Ray said, the university implemented YouTube before everyone else. Sorry, along with everyone else. So what we did is we have a main channel, which is the USC channel. Let me put that in full screen. Um, and this one is, is broken up into arts, lectures, and schools. If you... Uh, 1929. 
the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. It's a great video. I'm not sure it's Southern California. Um, if you hit schools, you get, uh, we actually have 18 schools, but we have 11 schools that had sufficient video when we launched this to put them up. So we have the law school right here, and I actually pulled it up on a separate tab already. this. Okay, so the law school and no one gave us a branding that we have to follow, but everyone decided that let's have a banner that unites us at the top that we put in Southern California and your sequel school of law, your school name after. So uh, some universities like Berkeley went with the route of taking all their classes and making them publicly available. We're not, uh, we're not there yet. We just have, it's more of a PR page. We're showing you our preview day, um, our dean's speech, our dean's welcome. Um, and, and we're just trying to sell other programs, like our international program, um, and just give you a sense of uh, what school is like at our University. We have what's called a preview day, which is an entire day of events in which every, we have two sample classes and every administrator comes out and talks to you about what they do and what's law school like. So we filmed it, put it online for two years in a row, and that created some content. We also have commencement ceremony. We do have some professors that don't mind providing content. So we have almost an entire class, evidence class on there from Dr. Lai. Yeah. And just let me go back and show you what, what is really the difference. Berkeley's, this is Berkeley's page. They were the first ones. So you can see what their channel views are like. 1.7 million, quite impressive. Um, but they have full courses. So you see physics here, biology, political science, and many other lectures that you're skipping out. And the comments from people are just fantastic. Thank you for your contribution to education. You know, and that's a risk that you're taking by leaving comments on. But when you do, you can either get great comments or terrible ones you have to erase the next day. So, <laughs> so I'll hand it off back to Ray. Okay, some of the pros, no limits. We could put, the videos have no limit in size and no limit on overall size of how big the videos are that we put up there. So unlimited space, something we could never do internally. Zero cost for that. Once again, this great wider outreach than we could do on our website. It promotes the life at USC and once again supports how student expectations. The only con we could come up with, and we had to think about this, was that if you don't have online access, you can't get to our videos because they're streaming, so you can't download them and watch them later. Why we decided to join um, Best of Breed, meet student expectations, cost savings once again. We don't have to buy servers, we don't have to administer those servers, we don't need a server room. All that is savings for us. No training or support requirements. We, don't, we didn't have to show students anything. They just know how to use it. Even our older folks, our older alumni, know how to use this. Um, once again, Google's willingness to help and support the project. As far as contracts, easy because it tied into our Google Apps contract. So basically the same um, relationship there that we had with Google Apps. As far as the implementation, it was so simple we didn't even need an implementation plan at this point. And I like implementation plans. We worked with the provost office. Internally we started increasing the amount of video captures. We got faculty buy-in, so the faculty that wanted to participate, we offered to videotape them and do it all for them, just to help get it going. There are, you'll find that there are some faculty that do not want to be videotaped under any circumstances. Yes. Yeah. And how, did, how did you deal with, I mean, would you say 20% of your faculty are going in this direction, or 5%, or? Uh, uh, I'd say there's 20% that are really into it and excited and give us all their videos, 20% that want nothing to do with it, and the rest are in the middle somewhere. And I have a question. I was wondering how you go about um, filming those lectures or events. Or you got a camera just like that in the back of the room. <laughs> so you have it in the 
in the, in the uh, we have some of our rooms are wired with cameras. Others we have portable units. The ones that we know, for instance, we have uh, Professor Lyons' classes at undergrad class. Okay. So we lug our equipment over there, record his class. We're using a basic camera, and we're capturing to a media site unit, and then we take that and convert it and upload it into um, YouTube. So you, you've heard of Sonic Foundry. The Sonic Foundry is who makes media sites, and that's another university contract that negotiated lower prices if we buy multiple units. So we have one static unit in a courtroom, and then we have a couple of mobile units. So pretty much any way you record video now, you would just continue the same way. There may be some uh, translation in, to get into the right format, but it all works out in the end. But you don't record VHS. I mean, you record like digital, yeah, like digital camera. Digital. Right. Yeah. Straight to WMV, and we just take the WMV and dump it on YouTube. YouTube takes care of the rest. So that is hooked on a hard drive? The, the camera in the yeah, some of our portable units are, yeah. You said Sonic? Oh, Sonic, Sonic Foundry. Foundry. Sonic Foundry has a media site unit, which will record air. You can take it and hook it up to any podium, and you'll be able to capture not only video, but whatever's presenting on the screen, and audio, and everything else. It's a really nice system. But if you just take a camera and record, you can take that and convert it into the right format. Yeah. Yes. Isn't comments moderation kind of labor intensive? I mean, YouTube is kind of sort of a wild west. Right? It, it is. Comments. And uh, that's your choice for video, not even for the channel as a whole. Every video you can choose if you should have comments or not. And I know this question is going to come up later, or if it's allowed to have ads or not. And every school decided if they want to have ads or if they don't. For instance, the School of Business, as you can imagine, they decided to have ads. And uh, we decided to have ads just to see what profits can come from it. And what Google does is Google, YouTube, they give you 50% of the profit from the ads. Um, and at the school level, we said that it would go towards scholarships. So any revenue from that would go to scholarship. And you have full control. What we did is turned it off, kept all the good ones, got rid of the bad ones, turned it off. <laughs> so they couldn't add any more comments. But you have total control over that, so it's nice. Other videos, you know, YouTube usually automatically add the links when you're done viewing it and also on the side. Right, you don't get that in, in, in the internal channel site. So it's like a silo, it's just your content. Yeah, it's a But channel. you're integrated, if you do a search on Google's website, you'll find our videos. And in fact, the, you know how you have the sponsored ads at the top? So if you search for USC, we'll be a channel at the top, like an enhanced link, and then you get the regular ones. Do you get a search? It's just of your channel thing? Uh, no, you don't get But at least they try to differentiate you from the rest of the, if you type USC, you're not going to get the cheerleaders. You're going to get the first link. It's going to be our university, so the official channel. Then you get the unofficial content. The other part of making this successful is, is making sure that you involve all the groups. So our PR department, administration, faculty, we needed to bring them all on board, and they were happy to, especially PR, because it gives them more outreach. Um, support, once again, pretty simple. They gave us a login, showed us how to do it. We went ahead and started uploading videos, and they were online ready to go for the world. It's very simple. Training, no training required. Everybody knows how to use YouTube. We haven't had any questions on how to use YouTube. As far as acceptance, um, like I said, not all faculty want to be videoed, and never will be videoed. Um, we focused on events of faculty that wanted to participate, so he went over all the different types of events. Our um, commencement ceremonies seem to be very popular. We actually do those as a live web stream, and then right after it's done, we put it on YouTube, so it's there also. Um, no problems or complaints with the implementation. We've been online nine months, and several of our videos have over 4,000 views. The video we just had when you first open up, used to be our admissions uh, dean. And she kept calling us saying, you know, people are calling me from all over the country saying that they know me or they've seen me. She really, she liked it. I mean, first she was kind of, she didn't like all the, the popularity or the attention, but she's got a lot more students and faculty and other administrators calling her because they've seen her on this video. And now I'm gonna let Nazi go into some tech details. Okay. So. 
I just want to cover the differences in what a channel is, a sub-channel, and an enhanced channel. Those are different options that you'll have if you talk to YouTube or when you talk to YouTube. So what we did is, what we have is one main channel, which as you can see is branded in a particular way. Um, they let you do a navigation map on it. They, uh, they remove, so there's no ad whatsoever, and it's just this top banner area. There's quite a few enhancements. Now, they'll only give you one of those, of this main channel view. Then they'll give you what's called um, enhanced channels, which are, this banner size is not going to be this big, as you can see with the Google School of Law, which is a little bit smaller. Um, but the rest of the features stay there, and you don't get a navigation map. Little things change. Now, different schools went different directions. For instance, Duke, all they wanted, they have, they have their main channel, and they only wanted two sub-channels. We decided to have as much as 18, and then we put that in our contract. We wanted 18 sub-channels. So these are the things you should look out for and request in your contract. If you know that your school's not going to be centrally managed, Berkeley centrally manages their content. So everyone has to submit to the main site. We let every school have their own site. So based on your decision, negotiate that on the contract ahead of time. And I think you have to have a minimum of 25 videos for each sub-channel. Yeah, we set that rule for our sub-channels. Um, simply because we didn't want a page with two videos, and then we'll link that an enhanced page. Next, um, I want to cover a little bit about um, what we had to do for batch uploads. So you don't necessarily have to use their interface. They give you, uh, imagine if you're filming a class and every day you want to upload 20 videos. It can get pretty intense to uh, upload all those in there. You can do uh, an SFTP upload and they'll walk you through it and the code for doing that is actually on your CD as well. Um, the only thing you have to do is negotiate a username and password with them and you can then upload your content in an XML file and they'll place it in the right place for you. Yeah, what we did is, are you aware of Shibboleth? Single sign-on. So we gave one rep in every school a single sign-on login to this YouTube server, which we called YouTube.usc.edu. Once you go there uh, and you log in, you can upload your content in batches, and then it goes to your specific channel. So say Ray is administrator for the law school, any of his content would go just to the law school. Okay, so but there's only one login for each school? They can share it. As well. Well, yeah, there's only one login. Right. So if a faculty member wanted to provide for that school, you would have to go to that central. Authority. And what ended up happening is the PR person in every school became that central authority because they wanted to review the content before you put it out for the world. No problem. Um, video conversion, there is none. You really, you don't have to convert it to anything. You don't, if you pre-convert it to Flash, actually it'll harm it, because what will happen is when you upload it to YouTube, it'll convert it twice the speed, so your video will be faster. Um, and then channel branding is very easy, a background image and a banner. That's all it took. And then I wanted to show you guys what our interface looked like for, um, YouTube has a partner site, and this partner site allows you to view um, how many hits you're getting on your videos. Let me close this one. Content manager, there it is. So this is uh, their content manager. It lets you see and associate other channels with your own. So for instance, if uh, tomorrow we decide to bring up another school, we can just add it in here. And you can monitor how many videos have been uploaded so far, how many hits they're each getting. So, see, the numbers add up pretty quickly. This is nine months later, and we're just happy to make impressions out there and have people view our videos. Um, but you see a breakdown of every school and how many videos they have. See, USC Lectures only has one video. That's a big no-no. We usually contact them and have them upload some more. And now, oops. Of 
we keep our own master. Um, we haven't asked to be a master. Any more questions? Okay. We'll move on to uh, iTunes. Okay, so iTunes, we're no longer dealing with uh, Google, we're dealing with Apple. Apple's not as bad as Microsoft, but they're not as good as Google. Uh, here we wanted to provide the students with an easier way to access their data, and our big slogan was learning on the go, so that they can take it with them. They can be on vacation, on a boat, pull out their iPod, and watch a class. Um, and once again, I'm let Nazi start with a demo, because that's the exciting part. So um, it's, it's a very simple address, itunes.usc.edu. And you either get university access or public access. Now, I'm in remote desktop, so things are going to be a little bit slower. Um, you can, we provide you basically and tell you what this is. Um, we give them an FAQ in case they need iTunes. We have download iTunes here and support. We point them straight to Apple. Um, <coughs> let me first explore the university public access one. So you hit public access, iTunes actually opens in the back and it shows you all the content that we have uploaded. Um, these links you create yourself, this content on these thumbnails you generate yourself. And it's, it's actually pretty painful to generate all this content because you have to use their interface and navigate using iTunes and iTunes is pretty slow for responding to things. So, for instance, um, faculty at USC, if I click that, it looks, it takes me to a subcategory with uh, two other options. If I click what matters to me and why, it looks just as if you're in the iTunes store. And the artist being the professor, and this is your album cover, and your tracks being your lectures. Now, the cost is free, you can get it, and it'll just download and play. They also have sub-tabs, so you can separate that into different years, which is pretty nice organization. Now, I'm actually going to take you back and go through a university login. And the university login, it's a single sign-on again. And the code for a single sign-on, our course permissions, all of that, is on your CD as well. Um, I'm going to log in with my account. It happens that I am um, also an admin on iTunes, so you're going to see some options that you wouldn't regularly, and I'll navigate you guys through that too. So as you see, it says accessing iTunes store at the top. It logs you in, and now you see USC courses. Now, I'm seeing every single USC course that is on iTunes, but students would only see the courses that they're registered for. So let me jump into digital tools for architecture. Um, and you see what happens, the different icons up here for different things. So if it's a video, it says get movie, and the icon appears there, but it's just like you're used to in iTunes. Um, if it's just audio, it doesn't say anything, you can upload PDFs as well, and that'll display a little book icon. Um, you can always edit this page, but I'm going to go to the main page and click Edit Page, just so you guys see what an administrator interface looks like. So if I click Edit Page here, and you see what I mean about the slowness? There you go. You get these little icons, these little pencils, um, next to everything, and you can always add a course. So there's course templates. You can add a course, you can edit a course, uh, you can manage the permissions for a course. Now the hardest part, as you can imagine, is integrating this with your student system so that the permissions are correct, so that Ray doesn't see the courses that I'm in or the courses from last year, because that might have, say, a final exam review. So. What we did, that was uh, the hardest piece in the integration, and that is on your CD, on, on how to go about getting data dumps and then managing the permissions. Because you pass to iTunes the courses that this person is allowed to see. It, it's just 
a comma separated list of the courses they're allowed to see. And, and based on that, that's the only thing they will see. And you wipe, you wipe that out every semester and reload Yeah. In fact, um, the feed comes in every day at 2 a.m. So even if you withdraw from the class today, you won't see it tomorrow. Yeah. What's the difference between putting a lecture on YouTube versus iTunes? Great question. Um, putting it on YouTube means it's public. So there's no permissions, there's no password protection. Everyone can see it. If you put it on iTunes University Access, then only the student that logs in can see it. The other difference is YouTube has unlimited space. Apple limits us to one terabyte of space per school, for the entire school. It, it's not awful, but the, sorry, though. What happens in the future? Because I know as a student, I would want to go back and listen to the post lectures from other semesters. Is, are they just SOL? Or? Yeah, SOL okay. is the word. Um, can they, they can download them. They can download them. In fact, it, that was part of the risk. So we, we debated whether to do a watermark mm -hmm. or an audio bump that every once in a while says this content is a USC law, just with a sexier voice. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but we didn't do that. Um, so once you download the content, it lives on your computer. So you okay. can do whatever you want with it. That's a risk that you guys should look at. Format requirement as well? Yeah, and that's a pain in it, it's MP4 format, and you can imagine nothing is recorded in MP4. So you're on your own for converting this to MP4 before you upload it to them. They won't convert it for you. And not only that, it needs to be specific size. It needs to be 320 by 240. So it's it's a real pain. The conversion process and, and actually Ray had it here as one of his cons is the video conversion to MP4 awful part because imagine just the processing power you have a machine dedicated to this and it just sits and processes video yeah so what use are you seeing at your school between in general for yeah. this in terms of lectures and faculty wanting to or letting you <laughs> Ray will cover it and and do they all opt for iTunes because it's password protected <clears throat> as my faculty would or <laughs> no, actually, Ray, Ray's going to cover this in a second, but I'll tell you, um, we really try to push the use of iTunes, but faculty are just not interested. Um, we created 10 free laptop and recording kits with mics, so you can record to MP3 directly, you can record video, give them cameras, briefcases, etc. We, we call them the Apple briefcases. That was not successful. People are not using iTunes. Our faculty are not using iTunes as much as we want them to. But I thought you said it was MP4, not MP3. Yeah, it's MP4. Okay. But if you're recording just audio, it's MP3. Oh, okay, just audio. Yeah. They didn't want video. Video is MP4. Did, did your provost's office have any trouble with the content coming down to people's computers and being, you know, losing control of that? that, that there were concerns, but once again, they signed off on it. They did. So we stay out of that part. Yeah, my, my university won't sign off on that right now. Really? Yeah. yeah. They're saying no. Well, you might want to look at the watermark or the sound bumps. Okay. It may be a possibility. Okay. There is uh, DRMA utilities yeah. you can the, put into it. But the, the Makes bad it thing more is trouble than it's worth. You don't get iTunes's built-in DRM. So, you know, like the one you get for your songs, right. they can only copy it to three devices and it's limited to you. You don't get that. Actually, Apple's contract does not allow DRM. The service contract with Apple, iTunes University, you can't do DRM. You can't do DRM, DRM open, which is how iTunes is moving in anyway. Right. You know, but they don't yeah. allow it. Yeah. You also can't charge for any content with iTunes. Yeah. So if a student group comes and says, hey, we want to raise money and post our video or our audio files and have people pay for them, you cannot do that. Yeah. We can do it just not through iTunes. Well, yes. <laughs> Leopard 10.5 is a podcast producer yeah. to do this process of conversion. Yeah, I was going to recommend actually another tool called Profcast, which is built for universities, and it's great. You turn on your PowerPoint, you drag it into this program, and then you start talking, and it synchronizes your slides with your audio. Profcast. Profcast. And it's really dirt cheap. I think it's 30 bucks. 
So some of the pros, ease of use, student expectations, zero cost, increased outreach. Um, like I said, not as good as Google. The cons, iPod usage. Not everyone has an iPod. And a lot of people just have this conception in their head that if I don't have an iPod, I can't use it. So we lose a lot of people that way. Also, iTunes usage. Some people just think iTunes only works on a Mac, so they don't even try. They just kind of, okay, can't do it. And then converting to MP4. That's a real pain. Uh, why we decided to do it? Once again, meet uses, expectations, cost savings. They weren't as flexible again. They only give us one terabyte, which means that's part of why we have to clear it out every semester, because one terabyte across the entire university gets eaten up really quick. And then um, we wanted to increase reach and usability for the um, students. As far as contract, like I said, less flexible. We negotiated from 500 gigabytes to one terabyte. That was all we could get. Um, implementation, it was pretty simple, but the way I see it is, um, it's kind of like a blog. If a professor has a blog and we've set them up, if they don't update the content continuously, people aren't going to come back. And we found our faculty aren't updating their iTunes, so people aren't coming back. So this is one of our implementations that technically everything's there and it works, but it just hasn't had the amount of acceptance and participation that we had hoped. So we don't know where this one's going to go. YouTube and Google Apps were just so much more easier and accepted and people like them. As far as support, they set up the accounts. We then upload the, the data. Um, there was a lot of technical work that Nazi went over and you can see all the programming. But once it's all set up, it's fairly easy at that point. Training, students who know how to use iTunes and iPods, they're already there. We helped them install iTunes if they had a PC, because a lot of them had no idea what it was. And like I said, as far as acceptance, it's just not where it was. Uh, we don't push it a lot as much anymore, because there just isn't the desire, the need, and students prefer the YouTube. They'd rather go to YouTube and watch the video than just hear sound. One of the things that we do have that is successful because we have faculty talks every week, and so some of the professors got together and they got some student workers to dictate the papers into an MP3 format, and we upload that to iTunes. They can then plug in their iPods and then take it and listen to the faculty talks before they get to the faculty talks. So they like that part. So that works good for them, but you know that's not much participation. And there's a couple more things that Nazi wanted to go over on the tech side. So um, I showed you the difference between the university access and the public access. Not university access, any university access. Well, let me switch back to this. Okay. Um, course permissions. Uh, that was that was the hard part. And integrating with internal systems. There's actually uh, a diagram. If you guys would like me to go over it, I can. And, and it's how you integrate your system with your iTunes system with Sys. Um, and then management and request handling. That was uh, a little bit of a pain because every time a professor wanted to add a course, we would have to add it manually. You couldn't just flag it as to please add this to iTunes in your next upload. So what we did is we created a form that is, I don't think it's accessible from here. Register. No, it says you need to be on the USC campus to access this. So I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so that's our request form. And it's uh, basically tell us who should have admin access to your course. If your TA is uploading content, you can have administrative access. And um, we, do, we do everything on your 10 digit ID. So just tell us what that is, and we'll create the course for you and uh, you can take it from there. So if you were thinking of how to manage it, that's how we went about it. And then we switch back. And uh, now we are open to uh, any questions you guys want to ask. Do you have a simple the clock testing? Uh, I guess it's part of the outcome where you separate the PowerPoint and the audience and this is the if we have it? Oh, I don't have it installed on my machine. I'm remoted into my machine, actually. I work, but I don't have it installed there.
It's on our most immediate machine. Is that the port that the output? Um, yes. Yes. Let's compare that to that in the mentioned earlier. Sure. Let me pull up a course and see if we have one. I believe we do. Any questions in the future? Feel free to email us.